encourage you in that, that God is preparing our hearts. You know, God doesn't look at the outside, He looks at the heart. You know, so God is touching our hearts, and He wants us to live a life that's close to Jesus. You know, Jesus' teachings and practices were to release us into a different place of obedience to the Father. You know, Jesus didn't do anything unless he heard from the Father. And you and I shouldn't be doing anything unless we've heard from Jesus. Amen. He guides us, leads us, and I believe that he wants us to live a lifestyle today that is uniquely different. And I believe the church today is called to be a prophetic church because we are prophetic people. You know, the, the word of God is prophetic. You know, in most times God said things and then they happened. God said things long before they happened. And throughout the word, God keeps doing that to encourage us to look forward and look to the future with a sense of opportunity that's coming for us. So Jesus led the way, and I believe he's calling the church to lead the way today in a very powerful way. You see, we are ordained, we are called by God to fulfill a purpose, and God puts his ability in us so that we can do great things for him. You see, you aren't a sinner anymore. You were a sinner. You are now a saint. Amen. Come on. You've got to change your thinking. And I believe God wants the church to see that we are sinners saved by grace. Therefore, we've moved from a sinning mentality into a, a grace understanding that we are now saints in God. Come on. When Paul wrote his letters, he wrote to the saints in Ephesus. He wrote to the saints in Philippi. He wrote to the saints in Corinth. He didn't write to the sinners in there. He said, no, they were, you were already saved. I want you now to learn something to become mature in God. You see, God, you know, I don't believe when God saves us that, you know, we, we kind of then struggle on onwards and upwards with the, the things in our lives. You see, God totally causes our sin nature to die. That's why the word says we die to self. You know, and yeah, we're struggling with sin, but we actually we are dead to sin in Christ. We've got to allow the power of God to work through us so we live a saintly life. And I believe God is trying to show us that today in a very real way. So from now on, you've got to speak to each other like you, the family, the family of saints. Yeah, at King, at King's Mercy Global Church. Amen. That's who you are, the saints. So when you write to the saints, yeah, you've got to write a letter to them and say, I'm so glad to be part of what God has called us to. You see, God is calling us to a deeper relationship all the time. And it's whether we can, you know, take that as in faith and know that God's called us to a deeper level of expectation in Him. And I want to say that to you as a church tonight. Do you have a greater expectation this year than you had last year in what God's got for you as a church? Come on. We need to see that because I believe it's an important time. We live in anticipation of God doing new things in our lives because that's what God does. He keeps moving us on. He doesn't leave us stuck in, in the past. You know, God wants us to know the present future that we live in. God doesn't want you to live in the present past. No, no, no. He wants you to live in a future and a hope that he's called us to. So I want you to see something because he wants you to live a life that's fruitful right now. Not tomorrow, today. He's calling us to a fruitful life right now. To look ahead, look down the road and see, gee, this is what God is doing. We need a vision longer than just our uh, you know, day to day, what's God going to do today? Now, God wants us to have a vision for five years and ten years uh, forward. But, you know, we don't plan ahead. We don't look ahead with anticipation and say, God, what are you going to do? What will I look like in ten years' time? What will this church look like in ten years' time? If we pray and believe God for the great things he's doing, there should, there's going to be some communities and families and people that are going to be changed because this church will be much bigger, much more mature, there will be more saints in here and hopefully the sinners will be coming in because we invite them in come on yeah God wants us to post our lives out there to know that he's going to make some changes you know we can't just live life in the normal challenges and the chores of today we've got to have something more than that to look to and want in our hearts and our lives amen you see the Holy Spirit is connecting us today continuously with what God has got for us in a very powerful way and he's saying come on church let's live now but plan for tomorrow Come on, 
we need to have that understanding. Amen. You know, Christians today, you know, we don't just live that spontaneous life. I know that I've got a plan for tomorrow. I've got to think, what is God saying to me? And how do I live in the tension of today and tomorrow and the future? And God wants us as people to know that he's calling us to live a different life. Amen. Let's plan. You see, the paradox that comes between today and the future, you see, a paradox is something that is contrary to, um, you know, anything that's self-contradictory to a declaration of, of things that are factual. In other words, Scripture says, he who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake shall find it. It's the opposite. Uh, you know, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It's the opposite to what the world says. You first, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. The world is the other way around. But us as Christians, we live godly principles, and we live in the tension of those two areas of our lives. Amen. But God wants us to have something in our lives that is very different. He wants us to walk into the new season that He's got for our lives. You know, and he's, he's, he's moving us into something that is different in relationship, a more dependency on him. You see, I believe the church has put itself in a box. We put ourselves in four walls, and often we look inwards and we don't look outwards. And when we look inwards, we find fault with one another. But when we're looking out and we're looking at opportunity that God's got for us, we see the opportunity and we recognize that God has called us to look and see where God is going to move in a powerful way. You see, your, your opportunity and my opportunity is to look with the eyes of Jesus when we look at people and circumstances and see where we can bring Christ into that situation. So normally we should, but if we're looking in and we become judgmental of one another, we miss what God's got for our lives. Amen. So let's not put each other in a box. You see, I believe that, you know, the only time God was in a box, he said, if you touch that box, I'll kill you. You see, you know, God thinks in a different way. When he was in the Ark of the Covenant and they tried to manhandle the Ark of the Covenant, you know, we know that the man that touched that Ark was killed. You know, and David was afraid of God, it says, on that day. But you know what David realized after some time? That he had to get some priests to go and carry the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. And you see, the scripture says that when God ordained priests to carry the Ark of the, of the Covenant, in other words, when you and I are called to carry the presence of God, there were some things that had to be prepared in those men's lives, in those priests. What they would do is they would anoint the earlobe, they would anoint their big fingers, their, their thumb, and their big toe before they could go and pick up the Ark of the Covenant. That spoke about, we better be careful what we hear, better be careful what we handle, and be careful where we go. And you know, today that same principle applies to our lives. God wants us to be careful what we hear, careful what we handle, anything to do with God, how do we handle it? Very, very carefully. And wherever we walk, we should bring the preparation of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our feet are called to bring something very holy in God. You see, one of the things I believe that God has put, you know, incredible uh, tools and talents and abilities within the church and within our lives to be successful. You know, God says to us, you know, and, and he encourages us in Scripture. In Ephesians 3 verse 20 says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you might think or ask, exceedingly abundantly above. That's what God's promised the church. And we don't receive that. We don't recognize that. We don't walk in that. Why? Because we don't take the fullness of the word. You see, I believe the reason some people are more successful than others is those that are successful recognize the potential that is within their lives. The God-given potential that's in their lives, they grab hold of it and they say, this is what God's given me. I know I've got to walk in that. Amen. So they choose to walk in life in a very positive way, knowing that God is for them, he's not against them. Amen. God keeps moving us forward. You see, I believe changes that take place in your life and my life aren't big decisions we make once a year. There are a whole lot of succession of small decisions that we make every day to keep us on the path of God.
Come on. And I, I want you to hear that. Not everybody's going to be a CEO of a major corporation, but you and I are called to be good fathers, good mothers, good brothers, good sisters, good saints, good disciples. We are called to do those things. What's more honorable than that? To be able to have the honor to honor God and honor people all around us. You see, I believe that's what God's called us to do. He's calling us to get out of our box, not to put ourselves in that box and, and to, you know, uh, kind of limit ourselves. You see, when the disciples met with Jesus one day and they were talking to Jesus, they were arguing about who would be positioned in a very prominent place in heaven. They said, Jesus, when we get up to heaven, who's going to sit on your right hand? Who's going to sit on your left hand? They wanted a position of prominence, of recognition for what they were going to do. And Jesus said this in Matthew 18. He said, and first he calls a little child to himself. He says, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to himself and set him in the midst of them. And in verse 3 it says, Assuredly I say to you, unless you are converted and become as a little child, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. There's a powerful statement for us. Unless you become converted as a little child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse 4, Therefore, whoever humbles himself as a little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Isn't that a powerful? You see, Jesus was having a serious moment with his disciples. He was saying to them, you know, unless you become converted and childlike in your manner, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, you have to have a childlike faith in God. You've got to believe his word like a child. You've got to have faith and be childlike in your understanding. He says, then you'll enter the kingdom of heaven. He says, unless you humble yourself, great things will elude you. That's what Jesus was giving his disciples, some good advice. You see, and I want to say to you, the same applies to our lives today. You see, redemption, I believe, is about recovering who we are to be in Christ. Amen. So you're recovering who you are in God. At this very moment, you're walking in the redeeming power of God by the, by the Holy Spirit. He's leading us. You see, the Holy Spirit in your life always brings glory to Jesus. He points us to Jesus all the time. So when we start work, walking out of the purposes and the will of God, the Holy Spirit comes and he taps us on the shoulder and says, no, 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 that's not the way of Jesus. This is the way. I want you to change the way you operate. So God wants us to recover the way we think, the way we, we walk, the way we speak, the way we act, the way we love. You know, that's, how, that's what God's calling us to do. That, that sort of behavior truly reflects what heaven is like for us. So God's speaking to us. He's speaking to us about the divine DNA that God has put in us. You see, the divine nature attribute of God that comes upon us when we are saved means that we have the heart and the love that God has put in us starts manifesting out of your life and my life to touch other people. You get hungry for the people out there that God's called you to. So I believe that God's calling us to reflect heaven in a greater way. So I, I, I believe that, you know, the church today, we've made simple things complicated. And God wants us to keep the simplicity of the gospel um, and the power of the gospel in a very real way so that anybody who hears the gospel will know that it's the words of Jesus so that the weak will understand. That's what Jesus spoke to the weak. He spoke to the, you know, to the people that, that needed to know their journey. You see, we're retracing our steps in the church, I believe, on a spiritual journey with the Lord again. So, you know, let me encourage you. Let's become a little bit more like, you know, have faith like a child. Come on. Um, let's just be, you know, I'll, I'll share this story with you. My little grandson, who's about three and a half years of age, um, He's got a lovely way of praying. And Linda hurt her foot the other day when we went walking. And, he, and my little grandson said to Linda, he calls her Mama, he said, Mama, I need to pray for your, for your foot. Your, your foot doesn't look so good. <laughs> so he doesn't say, Jesus, please heal. 
He says, thank you, Lord Jesus, for healing Mama's foot. You know, he's already thanked the Lord before he's asked the Lord. That's his faith. He's already believed that that foot, as he thanked Jesus for it, the healing was there. He comes back a bit later, and he says to Linda, how is your foot, Mama? Is it better? And I mean, you know, there's just such simplicity in it. And I believe, you know, we're making these things complicated when they're not. We just have to lay hands upon the sick, speak in Jesus' name. Name and, it, and have an anticipation that God heals. Amen. Amen. You see, I believe that um, in Matthew uh, 4, 13 verse 44 says a very interesting thing. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that is hidden in a field, which a man found and hid for the joy over it. He goes and sells all that he has to buy the field. So it's a very interesting statement. You see, God wants to provide a field, a treasure that is buried in, 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 in our lives. You see, you are earthen vessels where you carry treasures that are hidden inside, and God wants us to recover what is inside of us. The, you know, what I'm saying to you is what God has put inside of you, we as a church need to know what every gift is and what every calling is in the church today, and yet we don't know that. And God's saying, let's recover that for the joy of it. Let's get out there. Let's dig around in the spiritual realm till we find our gifting so that we can operate powerfully in God. There's a treasure that is in your life. You see, heaven uses a different language when it speaks to us. It speaks to us about the goodness of God, about the gifting of God, the, the divine nature attribute that God has put in you. That's what God speaks to you. He doesn't speak to your sin. He speaks to what is inside of you so that you will rise up. Linda and I Amen. counsel people, and, and most times when we counsel them, we don't speak to them a lot about their sin. We speak to them about the potential and the call and the purpose of God in their lives. Amen. And then they say, wow, that's who I am. Okay, now I'm going to get up and become that person. And, and the sin thing falls off them, and they, allow that, they don't allow that sin thing because we're not supposed to live in a sin mentality. This is, you know, that I'm a sinner, whoa. Or, you know, no, we're supposed to rise up out of that in Christ and become who God called us to be. Amen. So I want you to see something. God speaks to our potential. He speaks to who you are going to become. Come on. He doesn't speak to who you are not. No, no. He speaks to the treasure that is within you. And I want you to hear this because God most times speaks about our destiny. He speaks about the inheritance that he has promised us as children of God. And we need to see that. You see the example in scriptures about Gideon in, in um, Judges 6. It speaks about Gideon. You see, Gideon was like us. He was angry. He was depressed. He was frightened. He was hiding in the, in the wine press, making bread. You know, when you're depressed, you make bread. You do those things. <clears throat> and uh, he asked God, why have all these things happened to us? Why have we not seen you anymore, Lord? Where are you? You see, Gideon was angry. He had low self-esteem. Sounds like a bunch of Christians to me. And he was bitter. He was resentful. He was arguing with God. And, he, and, and then the angel of the Lord shows up while he's in the wine press. You see, God had called this man to set the Israelites free and to bring them out of bondage from the Midianites. So the angel arrives, and the angel says, You mighty man of valor. So Gideon, he looks around. Who's this angel talking to? Who's this angel referring to in, the, in this statement? And the angel says, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Suddenly Gideon realizes, hey, this angel is talking to me. You see, the angel wasn't speaking to the depression or the anger in his life. The angel was speaking to the potential that was in that man. He said, you are a mighty man of valor. And then you look at the actions of Gideon after that. He goes and he pulls down the altars in his hometown. He you know, blows the trumpet and he calls the nation to war. Where's that frightened man gone? You see, the angel spoke to who he was. And then Gideon rose up and become. He became who God called him to be. He became a deliverer of Israel. Because God called him forth in, in that time. You mighty man.
And I believe that God is speaking to the church, that the church becomes that glorious, powerful church. You see, the angel didn't speak to any issues that he had. He spoke to him, um, and he said, you need to rise up, man. You, you need to become who God called you to be. And, you know, and I, I believe that, you know, when we blow the trumpet, when we blow... The, and, and we call things into order in our lives. Scripture says that when they blew the trumpet, generally it was for three, three or four reasons, mainly three reasons. It was the coming of the king, it was to get the army ready, and to prepare us for war. And I believe that God's doing all those things today. There's a trumpet blast in the church calling us to prepare for war. There's a trumpet blast to say, hey, the king's coming. The Lord Jesus, he's coming. He's coming for his church. And he says, come on, get ready. Get ready for battle. Be ready. And I believe that God's getting the church ready. You know, in Ephesians um, 5, Paul says to the church, wake up, you are asleep. He says, wake up, you're asleep. And, you know, I'm going to take it one step further. I believe what Paul was saying, you need to wake up. You know why? Because you have been walking around, but you've been sleepwalking. I don't know if you've ever sleepwalked and you sometimes wake up at night and you go to the bathroom and you come back and, and your wife says to you where did you go? So I didn't go anywhere no no you went to you went somewhere you're sleepwalking and it's sometimes I believe God is waking the church because we've been sleeping come on he's saying come on arise church you're not frightened anymore I've called you I've called you in Christ so you see, somewhere in the heart of man, something changes when things come, you know, when God speaks to us prophetically. Because he speaks to the potential of who we are. He speaks to the man, to the woman of God that you should be. Come on. And I want to ask you tonight to open your heart. What is God saying to you that you should be? Not what you're thinking, not what others have said about you. What is God saying to you who you should be, who you should rise up into? Amen. You see, there was a man in the New Testament called Zacchaeus, and he hears that Jesus is coming to town. And Zacchaeus is a short man. It says that um, he was a man that um, he was, you know, in, in Luke 19, verse 5, um, it talks about Zacchaeus. He was, um, he ran the IRS, or the, you know, he was the CEO of the IRS. He was a wealthy man. He had all the money that you could think of, uh, but he'd heard of Jesus. And he heard, this man Jesus is coming to town. I, I want to go and have a look. So it says he, he was a short man, and he ran down the road, and he climbed up the tree to watch to see when Jesus was coming. Now, many of you might think he was a short man. That's why I had to run and climb the tree to see what, what, what and when Jesus came in. But I want to suggest to you that he climbed the tree because if he was amongst the crowd, the crowd would have taken him out because he was a tax collector and they wanted their money back from this man. So he climbed the tree to get away from the people. But when Jesus sees him, he says a very interesting thing. He says, listen, Zacchaeus, make haste. Make haste. In other words, be quick. Come down, for today I must stay in your house. You see, Jesus was giving him an invitation. And everybody in that town wanted Jesus to come to their house and have a meal with him. But Jesus picks this man out and he says, come on, come down. Today we're going to have some meal together. Um, and this man wants to, of course, he jumps down and he honors Jesus by inviting him into his house. And the interesting thing that happens is, as soon as Jesus comes into his house, Zacchaeus says, I will give half my goods to the poor. He said, where I've defrauded anybody, I will pay back four times as much. You see, Jesus didn't say to him, when you come down the tree, bring your checkbook, bring your credit card. I want to get that money from you that you stole from the people. No, no, he didn't say anything. Jesus just said, I'm coming to have a meal with you in, in your house. You see, I, I believe that what happened was something changed in that invitation. And something changes in the invitation when Jesus calls us. He doesn't say, look, I, I want to get your money from you. You know, he doesn't say, bring your wallet, bring your bank account. He doesn't say that. But I will say this, that the last thing that does get saved when we as Christians is our wallet. Everything else gets saved first, but our wallet takes the longest. But Jesus 
just welcomes this man into, you know, and, and what does Zacchaeus do? He says, I want to be a blessing to my town. You know, all this money that I've got, suddenly he realizes that it's not his money, it's the Lord's money, and he starts giving it away, and he starts becoming a blessing to his city. He blesses his city, he blesses the poor, he blesses the needy. He said, yeah, we are, take my fortune. But what was it that changed that man's heart? You know, what was it that he was looking for? Suddenly he recognized that there was something significant about God in his life. Suddenly he found significance because Jesus recognized who he was. He said, come on, I, I want to have fellowship with you. You see, if you and I want to speak into people's lives, there needs to be relationship, there needs to be, there needs to be some fellowship. Then we can speak into each other's lives. And that's what happened to this man. He suddenly realized that, you know, there was fellowship, there was relationship, there was a significance that he then, you know, was able to um, receive from the Lord. He got rid of all his issues because, you know, Jesus was speaking to who he was. And this man then rose up and become, became a very generous man. He became a prominent figure in that town. Because Jesus came into Jericho, and if you read the history books, it says every time Jesus came back to Jericho, he went to Zacchaeus's house. So that became Jesus' uh, main you know, hosting home when he came into Jericho. And this man would look after him. I bet the rest of the town was jealous about that. But Jesus knew what he was doing. Yes. And often I want to say to you, Jesus knows what he's doing with our lives. He calls us into a place of significance. He calls us into a place of relationship. Come on. He calls us into a place of fellowship with him. And then he can talk into our lives. And he starts telling us great and mighty things which we do not know. You see, I believe the most important thing that God came to do in, our, in his redeeming plan was to restore relationship. You see, this Bible from Genesis to Revelation is about a loving God that came to restore relationship between man and God. Throughout every page you read, God came to restore you and I back. Adam and Eve lost that relationship. It says they walked with God in the cool of the garden. And then Satan came and they lost that relationship. But ever since then, God came to restore you and I back to relationship with him. That's why Jesus came. He died for us so that our relationship would be restored with the Father. Amen. And, you know, once you understand that, you know, you know that you're not just here on the earth to fill a space. You're here at the divine will and purpose of Almighty God. You see, it's a spiritual principle I want to talk to you about. What you speak to rises up. Come on. If I speak to nobility in you, nobility is going to rise up. If I speak to honor in your life, honor will rise up. If I speak to the, the call of God upon your life, it rises up. And you say, hey, I want to do this stuff. I want to be what God called me to be. Because it's a spiritual principle. You see, and we speak to those things. We speak to the call and purpose of God. If I speak to the flesh in you, the flesh rises up and wants to punch me on the nose. Because if I speak to anger, or I speak to something that you know about, that you're dealing with in God, sometimes, somehow it rises up in you. But if I speak to the godly principles that God has put inside of you, the call, the purpose, the gifting, and the abilities in God, it rises up and you say, I want to become who God called me to be. Why? Because God put that in your life right in the beginning. It says, you know, in Jeremiah, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew who you were. And God's saying that to us. He's saying that to his church. Before I called you to be formed as a church, I knew who you would be. I knew what family you would be in. I'm not talking about your, your birth family. I'm talking about your spiritual family. This is a spiritual family that you belong to. There's something very, very powerful about a spiritual family. Come on. There are things that go on in a spiritual family that are very, very unique. So God is concerned with who you are and not who you are not. God is, you know, speaking to our future and into who you and I will become. Amen. There's an ever, you know, outworking of God's purpose in your life. So Jesus comes along and he connects us with who we're supposed to be in the future. Amen. 
He connects us to destiny, to inheritance. And that's why families, when you look at families and you see your son and your daughter get saved, but then you see the effect of their salvation. They get married, they have children. And then when you look, you see your grandchildren are saved and they're serving the Lord. Mm. Something changes in your whole family line. There's, you know, four, there's four generations. You know, we're standing on the generation that's gone before us, folks. Come on. That's why we are becoming the glory of the Lord has been restored because our generation has been restored. That's why we've got to bring in spiritual sons and daughters so that they can become who God's called them to be. You and I have got to go and find them. And we've got to bring them into the house of the, the Lord. Because you can't look at that one person. You've got to look beyond that. You've got to look at the fact that they're going to get married. They're going to have children. And their children's children are going to serve the Lord. Amen. We've got to have sight for the future to know that that's what God's called us to do. Come on. He wants us to see something. So we've got to speak that prophetic word into the church. We've got to speak it into who we're going to be. You see, I, what I'm saying to you is really in the spirit, there's an exchange that takes place. Heaven has got a different language for you and I. And God wants you to just see that. There's an exchange, a, a displacement of the old so that the new can come in. Because God is working on our thinking. As a man thinks, so he lives. So that as you think and you plan your life, and, and the plan's not working out, let me su suggest to you that you change your thinking. Mm -hmm. And a good way to change your thinking is to get into the Word of God. Amen. Renew your thinking by the power of the Word of God. Your mind is transformed by the living Word of God. So if we're not thinking right, we need to go back to the book. We need to go back to the manual. We need to go back to the Lord and say, Lord, help us to think right. To think how you think about us. Come on. Amen. Am I making sense tonight? Amen. So, you know, the Lord is saying, let me have that thing that you're holding on to. So I'm going to challenge some of you tonight. There's some things that you're holding on to that the Lord's saying, give to me so that I can release you from that, so that I can give you what you need for the next season of your life. For where you're going in the next four to five and ten years, you're going to need what I've got for you, not what you're holding on to. Amen. Amen. And I believe the Lord wants us to hear that tonight. So let's just give to the Lord the things that have held us down, like a ball and chain. You know, things that, have, that we've carried with us from our old life. You are a new creation in Christ. You know, the old has died and passed away. And you need to hear that today so that you think differently about who you are. Amen. Amen. Let me read this, this uh, letter that Paul wrote uh, to the church. Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. I want to just read this. And, and I, I won't minister too late. Um, but I, I do want to minister something and then we will do some ministry tonight as well. But uh, this is what Paul said to the church. He says, for this reason, this is um, Ephesians 3, verse 14. He says, for this reason I bow my knees to the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Your family is named in, come on, heaven that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, and the height, to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him, as I quoted this earlier, is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you might even think or ask according to the power of the Holy Spirit that's at work in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations. There it is, forever and ever. Amen. You see, the testimony of the nature of God. God is a good God. And what he's saying is, my width, I'm big enough to cover everything in your life. He says, the length, I'm long enough to last forever in your life. I'm the beginning and I'm the end. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I can go forever in your life. 
I'm the height. He's big enough to touch heaven and cause us to touch heaven as God ministers into our lives. He says, I'm deep enough to redeem you from the worst possible sin that you could be living in. He said, I can redeem you from that and bring you up, sanctify you and restore you in God. That's what God's saying to us. He says, you are immersed in my love. The love that we need on a day-to-day basis is available for the church. And you know what? We need to have more love. The power of God's love upon us is a very powerful thing. And God wants us to understand that by love, He is love. But scripture says that God is love. The most powerful thing in the universe is God's love. Amen. Come on. God's love for us, the, God's love for mankind, for humankind, was He said in John 3, 16, He said, For God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son, that whoever should believe in Him what will have eternal life. That's God's promise to humanity. And we've got to just take hold of it. No other way but through Jesus is to the Father. You know, John 10, 9 says that. I am the door. No one enters, you know, into that place um, of, of the knowing the Father except through Jesus. I am that door. Amen. So let's understand that today. So God wants us to shine. I, I love it that you allow testimonies to be shared. Because, you know, testimony is a powerful recognition of what God is doing in our lives today. You know, our testimony is what God's doing currently in our life. Our testimony isn't when we were saved. That's our history. Our current testimony is, this is what God is doing in my life today. And I want to tell everybody what a good God I serve. So I encourage you to testify. You see, in the Old Testament, it says... The Ark of the Covenant was called the Ark of the Testimony. Wherever the Ark of the Covenant went, there was a testimony that God was at work in the midst of the church. The word testimony means do it again, God. And you and I share a testimony about healing. Suddenly somebody else in the congregation gets healed. We share the, the area about breakthrough in our lives. And, and this is what God has done and brought us through. Suddenly, somebody else gets years that their faith rises and they get encouraged because we are testifying about the love and the power of God. You have overcome by the, by the power of the Lord, power of your testimony, eh? by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. Come on, at least we not love our life unto death. You know, so testimony is very, very powerful. If you want to win somebody for Christ, share your testimony. Say, this is where I started, but look where I am now. Very powerful thing to do. Amen. But I want to just finish off by saying this to you, um, that, you know, the love of God is enshrined on the first commandment. Everything that you and I do is enshrined in that first commandment that God spoke to us about. And I'll, I'll use Mark 12 verse 30. It says, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And I believe if we can understand that about our lives, that as we love God, with all that we can be and all that we will be. God does some things in our lives. He reassures us. He, you know, God commands himself, you know, as, we, as he commanded us to love him. Um, he in turn loves us. He doesn't command something that he doesn't do himself. For God so loved us that he sent his son. But God says, come on, love me, and I'll show you a greater love that you've never ever heard or understood in your own life. Amen. Amen. So let's press in. You see, his love is within your heart. And I believe that God is touching our hearts. And I want to say tonight, uh, some of you have been struggling with love yet tonight. Been struggling with love in your heart. And I believe God just wants to impart some love here tonight so that you become healed, that you know that you're worthy as a son and a daughter to receive all that God's got for you because He loves you. You see, we need to understand that first and foremost about our lives. we sons and daughters loved by God. Come on. He did, you didn't call Him. He called you. He first called you. And when He called you, He called you with love. 
He said, I love you, my son. I love you, my daughter. I'm calling you into the kingdom of God because I've got a beautiful plan for your life. And I want you to know that my love for you is from everlasting to everlasting. It's not for 60 years or 70 years or 80 years or 100 years. No, no. This is an everlasting love that God's talking about. It's something so powerful we can't even comprehend it. It says, no eye has seen or ear has heard or entered the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. That's got to be us. Come on. That's us. Your eye haven't seen it yet. You, you know, and God wants to open our eyes to see just how much God loves us. Because when we have a reassurance, folks, that God loves us that much, we're going to walk a different way. We're going to touch people with the love of God in a very real way. And they're going to come to know the Lord because we demonstrate love. You see, I believe the, the, the power and the love that God gives us, we need power to love. That's why Paul said to Timothy, you do not have the spirit of fear, 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, you do not have the spirit of fear, but you have power, you have love, and you have a sound mind. Come on. You are speaking about the love of God, the power to love. God gives us power to love. That's why the word says you can love the unlovely. Come on. Who knows that God sends you to the mission field, you've got to love some unlovely people. God calls you to go and minister to some of those that, that are difficult people. I know other churches that I go to, there's Mr. and Mrs. Sandpaper in the church. It might not be yeah, but I tell you what, they, they're there to rub you up the wrong way, to you know, test your patience, to cause the pastor to, you know, wish that, you know, those bleating sheep would go somewhere else. But I tell you what, God gives us love to love people. Come on. So I'm speaking to you tonight about your heart attitude. Are you willing tonight to open your heart to allow the love of God to come in? That as that love comes in, there's going to be an expression of God's love through your life to touch mankind, to touch those that need to come and find Jesus for themselves. So my encouragement to you tonight is to rise up in that ability in God because God has put in you a potential. He's put in you a calling that he wants to demonstrate that calling in your life tonight that as he calls you, you're willing to stretch out and, and go and touch the, a broken world with the love of God and release the power of God into healing and restoration. Amen. I, I sometimes work with a company and they asked me to help the company um, some years back uh, and they said it would be a six month project and now nine years later I'm still helping them out and I think well maybe the Lord had um, you know I often used to say to the Lord why is why do I still keep on doing what I'm doing and you know I believe as much as they have learned something from me I've also learned something from them so God uses every circumstance where he calls you to help you know Christian businesses and men and women in in the world he teaches us something in the same process to about love how to love people and I want to say to you, let's learn to be people that give out of a heart of love. And the power of God will come upon you to express the love of God. Amen. Amen. So go and find them. Bring them in tomorrow night. Bring them in on Sunday. Go and find your neighbors. Go and find your friends at work that need to have an invitation. Most people respond to an invitation. They don't come unless you ask them. So go and find somebody and ask them to come. Amen. Amen. And then we can encourage them. Now, I committed, um, so yeah, there we are. Get the message, listen to it again, digest it, get it into your spirit, and allow God to raise you up to become who he called you to be. Amen. Amen. So I, I want to encourage um, the pastor and his wife tonight. I really feel to speak to them prophetically tonight, and then we'll have a time of prayer for any needs that are within the congregation. Is that all right? Um, I'm, I'm not too bad. I promise not to make you late tonight, so I'm doing all right. Um, you're not staying until midnight. It's all right. <laughs> Unless you want to, of course. Some of you will pray throughout the whole night and be here tomorrow, I know. Okay, can I ask you to join us, uh, Kate? No, I say, would you want to join us tonight? Yes, I 
Okay, do you want to come here? And I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Prince to come and join us. Is that okay? So I just want to encourage you prophetically. You don't mind if, uh, if you come and you can just face the camera if you don't mind. <laughs> so so the, the camera, I'll stand on this side here. I'm going to the camera. Sorry? Yes, yes. I'm going to show you that. You've got to get the good looking couple in the, in, the, in, the, in the camera there. Make sure it's in focus, brother. <laughs> you want to see the shine on their face. They shine for Jesus, eh? Hey? You know, I did sense that as I came into the church last night. And, uh, you know, when I come in, I always try to sense what the Holy Spirit is saying to me for the individuals, but also for the church as a corporate body and for the leaders of the church, because I believe it's we're living in crucial days. And, and I, I do sense that, uh, Pastor Prince and, and Kate, Pastor Kate, that, you know, God has called you to plant churches, not only to grow a church. And I just sense that there's something about that, you know, apostolic uh, thing that you're carrying in your heart there, brother, that God is uh, fulfilling in your life. And I want to say to you, you know, be ready and allow, the church has got to allow this couple to experience their gifting out in the, you know, in the wider kingdom of God, while you, you, you can use them to grow you pastorally and as leaders, but you've also got to allow them to extend their wings, to, you know, to extend their ten pegs beyond just the local church. And I believe that, you know, that's going to come in a greater way. You know, I, I do see you going back to Africa. Brother, I do see you have a message for the, the churches in Africa. And I want to encourage you in that because I believe you, you carry a heart to see the presence of God manifest in the church and to equip people. I see a teaching ministry on your life, uh, you know, to equip the saints and to get them into a place where they're going to learn and grow in the, the discipleship of, uh, you know, where Jesus said, make disciples. And I believe that God's raising you up to make disciples, men and women that will go out and start a work, start a new work in God. And I, I do believe that you see something in the church that you long to see an expression of Christ um, in, in the church where the presence of God comes and where the lost come in. And I, I do believe that at times your, your ministry, the enemy has come against your ministry because of the truth of God's word. You know, you've desired the truth and you've ministered the truth and you stood for the truth. You know, God today is looking for true worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. And I believe God's called you to demonstrate that and to walk in that. There's something about the truth that runs in your heart like a plumb line, that God is positioning that plumb line in your life in a very real way that when the enemy comes and deception comes in and the seducing spirits uh, you know come to deceive the church God's going to use you to help them to walk in a different way according to the ways of the Lord and you know we, the word says that Jesus is the way I believe you've called the church to walk in the way the way of Jesus so I want to encourage you brother to rise up and I believe that there's been some challenges that have come around you but that's the enemy trying to stop the vision that God has given you for many more fellowships that are on your heart not only in this nation but in other places so raise up sons and raise up you know couples that will run with you in what God has given you and what you're carrying in your life at this time I believe it's a season of fruitfulness ahead and you've fought the battle and you've you know you've travailed over the enemy and you've birthed something through that time of travail so well done and keep up the good work and I want to just say to you um, Kate I really believe that you have a heart for children and children's ministry orphans and those that are downtrodden that heaven known the love of God and even the power of, of you know family and God wants to use you to restore back those families and those children to understand the family that God has called them into so go and bring them in I believe that God will give you provision for for you know orphanage for children to look after them to restore them to give them hope for this generation so rise up and keep going in God amen, amen. I bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Pray for us. Sorry? We nearly pray. Yeah. Okay. Come and pray with me, my wife. <laughs> Father, just lift up, just lift your hands here, uh, please, congregation. Lord, we thank you as we stand as the body of Christ, as the family of God. Lord, thank you for this church. Lord, thank you for 
the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and Lord the yeah, Lord, the mercy that comes through knowing you and the mercy that you placed upon the church here. Lord, that it would be global in its vision, that it would bring in the lost, and that many hearts and lives will be restored through that global vision. And we thank you, O oh God, that you're doing something very powerful upon the church. Lord, I believe this is a defining moment. This is a Kairos moment in you. And Lord, as we lay hands upon them, that they will rise to a new place, a new place of authority, a new place of opportunity in their lives and in their ministry and I thank you O oh God that you're stirring up within them the vision that you've placed in their lives Lord bring provision bring a supernatural opportunity into their lives Lord we Lord the intentions of the father are released through them Lord you've called them so you will provide for them because your intention is to build your church and establish your kingdom through their lives and through their ministry and through their children and through their leaders here Lord and through the congregation Lord, you never looked at numbers. We, even with Gideon, you said, there are too many. Just give me those that are committed, those that uh, will, will stand with me in the battle. And, Lord, I know that you're raising up a remnant amongst us. And I thank you, Lord, that as you raise them up with a sense of fire in their heart and the word of the Lord upon their lips and in their hearts, that they will see your word go forth. It shall not return void, but it shall accomplish that to which you sent it out to do, and it shall fulfill all upon their lives and in their ministry to which you placed on them. Bless their family, bless their coming in and their going out. And Lord, I speak supernatural provision for them that will come in very unusual ways, even from overseas, that there will be a sense of just pouring forth and pouring out upon them. And we thank you for their lives and we bless them tonight in the name of Jesus, that favor would go before them in every way, in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, Amen. Lord, and I just thank you for this couple, Lord. And even as they kneel now, Lord, they kneel before you, that they kneel before no man, Lord. Father, that they understand honor and you will bless them with honor. So, Lord, we pray that their knees would always be bent before you and you alone, Lord. Father, that they would never desire to please man, but always to please you. Lord, I pray, I pray pray for their marriage, Lord, that it would always be filled with passion, with honor, with laughter, and with kindness, Lord. And I pray too, Lord, for your precious woman. I pray for Kate, Lord, Father, that she can be and become the incredible wife and woman that you've called her to be. Lord, that even this period where she goes out to walk, work would be short-lived, Lord. Mm -hmm. Father, that you would supply provision, Lord, that she'd be able to do and to hear and to listen to your word, Lord, in a place of peace and activity. Lord, even as the Proverbs 31 woman, she did many things, Lord, but you know how you've created Kate. And I pray, Lord, that she would dare to believe what you have for her. Lord, as she stands by her, her man as a, a husband and as a pastor's wife, Lord, bless them, Father. Let them grow strong in stature and let their lives always be pleasing according to you. Bring great men and women around them, Lord, that would stand with them in those times where they need their arms lifted, Lord, that those men and women would be prepared to do that, Lord, but that they would always be a team and that you would always be the leader of this church and in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Lord. Give them a hand. Encourage them. Bless you. That's good. I want to say to you. Thank you, sir. I want to say to you that one of our roles in the church is to always encourage our leaders. Let me say to you that, you know, as we travel around, one of the areas that, um, you know, we always identify is that our leaders need us to stand together in unity and stand with them because the fight is not against flesh and blood. It's against powers of darkness and principalities that come against the church. And we've seen some of the attack that has come upon the church in the years gone by. And we know that when we stand together, hand in hand with the Lord, that nothing can prevail against us. Amen. No gate, no devil will prevail against his church. Why? Because we stand together and we build together because Jesus is the builder and we just the co-laborers with him. Amen. Amen. 
So bless you all, and thank you for having us. Now, I, I just want to make an invitation, if I may, for those who feel they need some prayer tonight, uh, in that area of love, where I believe that the Lord's you know, speaking to you about love tonight, to open your heart, to receive love. Love, to, love for the Lord and love for one another. And, and I, I do believe that some of you have been through that area where you didn't know a lot of love as a young person and you don't understand fully how much God truly loves you. And there's some things that you need to deal with and go before God. And I want you to you know, respond if that's you and we just pray for you and just release you so that no fear, uh, no pain, no disappointments, no disillusionment will hold you in a place of... Uh, of darkness anymore that you will receive the full love that God has for your life amen so if that's you please respond and then we'll do some ministry after that is that okay so um, can I ask the music team to just give us a little bit of music if you need prayer and you're in the music team just come forward and, and just a little bit of uh, something on the you know and, and then we'll, we'll just pray for folks quickly is that okay is that is that right, yes. Pastor? Okay, okay. If you want prayer and the music, then we can receive a prayer before we sing. Yes. Okay. Come, love.
ba 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 ba